And the crayon box goes through some different colors, and if you're wearing the color that is set in the chorus, then you stand up while we sing about that color. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> just for me so I picked them up and I opened them up and I looked way down inside and the colors they reminded me of Jesus when he died red is the color of the blood that he shed brown is for the crown of thorns they placed upon him afraid to tell. Well, I colored and I colored till my crayons were all gone. And though I am much older now, my memory lingers on. When I see a little child with crayon box in hand, I tell him what they mean to me. upon his head. Blue is for royalty in which he did dwell. And yellow is for the Christian who's afraid to tell. Afraid to tell the story of Jesus when he died. He died for lonely sinners just like you and I. Someday soon he's coming back, back to be our king. And the colors of the crayon box you will see. One more time. Red is the color of the blood that he shed. Brown is for the crown of thorns they placed upon his Who's afraid to tell? Very good. Next one's I've been redeemed.
again to redeem ourselves. So music has been a really powerful thing in my life. Since I was a little kid, um, worship is really one of the core things that helped me grow in my relationship with the Lord. Ten years ago, I was on my second, headed to my second tour in the Middle East, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not allowed to get emotional today. Uh, and while I was there, we had a lot of uh, rockets and mortars and other things in different places, and and I quit listening to music altogether. And I couldn't handle anything over my ears. And so it took me years afterwards to be able to even listen to a song. My wife and I would go on trips. She'd turn the radio on and click it off. She's like, can't we listen to something? I was like, I'll sing to you. And, uh, but you know, it's been, a, it's been a long journey for me with music and it's been hard for me to get back into it. And so I just, uh, my wife asked me to sing a, a song called Beautiful this morning. Um, as we uh, just think about the ways God is beautiful, and I'd love to sing that to you this morning. Your face in every sunrise The colors of the morning are inside your eyes The world awakens in the light of the day Look up to the sky and say You're beautiful I see your power in the moonlit night Planets are in motion and bright We are amazed in the light of the stars It's all proclaiming who you are You're beautiful I see you there hanging on a tree You bled and then you died and then you rose again for me Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne Soon we will be coming home You're beautiful Oh-oh-oh-oh Just a memory and tears are no more. Well, in as the wedding bells ring, your bride will come together and we'll sing. You're beautiful. Oh, oh, oh. you're beautiful. Thanks. First Corinthians 1, 4 through 7 says, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that they belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now they have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Most kind and gracious Father, thank you so much for being here 
in the midst of us as we come here to worship you and to praise your name. We ask that you be with Lauren as she speaks today and help the words to be your words spoken through her. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. There was a little Adventist church that started out real small. And at first, they met in sanctuaries of other denominations. They would rent from these other churches. And for a while, they rented from a Baptist church. And later on, they rented from a Methodist church, all the time trying to save up money so that they could buy their own property and build their own church. Finally, they picked out a piece of land and began work on a new building. And that's when problems started. First, it was what color to paint the sanctuary. Then it was what kind of carpet to put in the foyer. When the church was finally built, the arguments grew into other issues, like what people should wear and eat. Then the fighting got so bad that when you walked into the church on Sabbath morning, you could sense the divide. One half of the church believed that good Adventists wore no makeup or jewelry, and men always wore suits to church with a tie. <laughs> and women always wore skirts, no pants. No, that pants are for men. You wore long skirts to your ankles and you never showed any skin. Those people sat on one side of the sanctuary and everyone else sat on the other side. Neither side talked to one another unless they were arguing. The fighting escalated to a point that some of the members of the church would ask people to leave based on what they were wearing. And they would go to potluck and they would throw out any dish that wasn't strictly vegan. <laughs> the last straw came when my grandmother came to church one Sabbath. She'd attended this church for years. She was there when they rented from the Baptist church. She was there when they rented from the Methodist church. And she was proud of the church's growth and their new building. She walked into church that fateful Sabbath and a young pastor approached her and said, sister, do you think God would want you to wear those pants in his house? And let me tell you, you don't talk to my grandmother that way. <laughs> no. Let me tell you, she doesn't need a lecture about being a good Adventist. My grandmother has been an Adventist her whole life. Unless she's sick, she doesn't miss going to church. She goes to every service. She goes to every Bible study. She even gives Bible studies to prisoners. My grandmother will not stand by and let someone lecture her on being a Seventh-day Adventist. And she looked at him and said, yes, I think this is fine. And he should have just left it there. <laughs> she gave him the perfect opportunity to just walk away. But that's not what he did. He kept going, and he tried to tell her that she needed to go home and change clothes. She stood a little taller, and she looked him right in the eyes, and she pointed her finger like this, <laughs> and said, you may think you're a pastor, you may look like a pastor, you may think that you act like a pastor, but you will never be my pastor. Then she turned and walked out. But that wasn't the end of that. My grandmother had been to this church a long time. This was her church. So she made a few phone calls. 
<laughs> she made a few phone calls to some high up church leaders and she was bounced around to a few different people until finally she was connected with the right one whose job it was to handle these sorts of situations. And she told him, we need you to come and fix the division in this church. Now I tell you that story because when I read this verse in 1 Corinthians, this is a letter that is written by Paul to the church in Corinth. I think of Paul being kind of like that poor church leader who took my grandmother's call. Because what's happening here is that Paul is writing this letter in response to someone in the church of Corinth telling him that something is going on. And it is something so serious that it demands Paul's attention. That verse that Bella read so well earlier is the greeting to the letter that Paul is writing. And Paul is writing this letter with a purpose in mind. Let me read you that greeting again. <coughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Sounds good, doesn't it? This part of the letter, it's kind of like when someone you love is trying to tell you something that you maybe don't want to hear, but you need to hear it. So they, really, so they start by really buttering you up, right? Maybe if they can get you to feel really good about yourself, it won't make you feel so bad when you, they have to tell you the hard truth. That's what this verse is. Now, how do we know that someone went to, the, to Paul and told on the church in Corinth? Go down to verse 11, and it says this. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, brothers and sisters. Just like my grandmother's church, the church in Corinth was having problems. And it may have started out small, they were probably arguing and fighting over our little things, and the problems grew. And quite frankly, this church had made mountains out of molehills, so to speak. Paul is going to address many problems in this letter, but first, he is concerned about fellowship. How do we treat one another? How do we handle disagreements? Verse 12. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Now I imagine that when you walk into the church in Corinth, you could already sense the divide. One area of the room had, a, had Paul's supporters. The other part of the room had a man named Apollos supporters. And in yet another area of the room, were the supporters of a man named Cephas. They were arguing, who do we belong to? Do we belong to Paul? Do we belong to Apollos and follow him? Or do we belong to Cephas and follow him? Who should we listen to? Who do we belong to? Who should we follow? Yet, that isn't the only thing that they argue about. They seem to argue about everything. As you read the first letter to the Corinthians, you'll see that there are a lot of issues that Paul addresses in this letter. They argue about marriage. They argue about spiritual gifts. They argue about food offered to, to idols. They argue about all kinds of things. And Chloe, the member who informs Paul of what's going on, she's had enough. And I can imagine her sending a message to Paul and saying, we need you to come and fix the division in this church. Maybe you can see it through the way that Paul approaches the issue. 
He approaches the issue very cautiously. Paul has only heard one side of the story from Chloe, so he is careful not to be too harsh. And you can see it from the greeting in this passage. Paul is being very gentle about how he addresses the issue. So he begins by greeting them, complimenting them, and blessing them. There's this beautiful greeting, and now Paul is going to gently transition into the problem he's about to address. Listen to what Paul says. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, brothers and sisters. Then Paul addresses the main issue at hand. Who do we follow? Chapter 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. Paul makes it clear in these first three chapters that there is only one thing that the church should be worrying about. There's only one person the church should be following, and that is Jesus. Paul then goes on to counsel the church on how to handle all of these different issues that they disagree about and to stop fighting about all of these little things that don't really make a difference. Does it really matter which apostle is greater? Does it matter what clothes you wear to church? Does it matter what color the sanctuary is? Do these things actually matter at all? No, there is only one thing that matters. And Paul even writes in verse 10 that we should be in the same mind and the same purpose. Not that everyone should agree all the time or that everyone should have the same opinion. We're all different people, so that's not going to always happen that way. But what Paul is saying is that everyone should have the same purpose, the same goal in mind. And what is that purpose? Paul has already told us in his greeting. And in fact, in the first nine verses of this letter, Paul has named what our purpose is 17 times. Listen for it as I read those verses. Paul, called to be an apostle but of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who are in every place to call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you are called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you hear it? Did you hear how many times Paul repeats it over and over and over and over in the greeting. He mentions God, Christ, Lord Jesus 17 times in just nine verses. Paul is trying to emphasize a point that Jesus is at the center of all that we do. Our purpose is to spread the good news of Jesus. Who do we belong to? We belong to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you didn't catch the hints in the first nine verses, then don't worry because Paul is going to make it more plain in this letter. Chapter 3, verse 7. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. Then verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that has been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't want these small issues to get in the way of keeping our focus on Jesus. And believe me, Satan knows 
how to distract us from our purpose. I once heard a pastor in California that I know say that if you want to split a church, redecorate. <laughs> if you want to split a church, redecorate. He then proved his point by telling this story. It's a story of a little Adventist church that split in two. The sanctuary in this church, it was kind of in an oval shaped, and the stage went out a little bit towards the middle of the room, and the pews fanned out around it to kind of give the room a sense of community. There was a wall that formed a half circle just around the sanctuary, and it was plain white, until one day, the church leaders came up with a great idea. They decided to paint a mural on this wall. The concept was to paint the whole plan of salvation. They would start from the Garden of Eden all the way down to the second coming of Jesus. And they presented their idea to the church and everyone loved the idea. The leaders brought in a painter to create the mural and finally when it was finished, it was revealed to the whole church. And most thought that it was beautiful, but there were some who saw a problem with the mural. They began to talk amongst themselves and they decided that this wasn't a small problem, this was a huge heresy. Perhaps the painter was an atheist or an evolutionist and they were trying to corrupt the minds of the children in this church. And that's why they included this heresy. This group brought their concerns to the pastor and the church board chair, but they didn't see what the issue was. What's the big deal, they said. Just don't look at it. <laughs> but that answer didn't satisfy the group. How can we not look at it? They told the pastor, it's right there in the first scene of the Garden of Eden. Every time we come into this church from now on, it'll be the first thing people see. But the pastor just said, it's a non-issue. Just don't look at it. Rumors began to spread around the church that the pastor was part of some kind of conspiracy to teach heresy to their children. Church members began to say that this pastor had bad theology and the teaching in his church was wrong. This group demanded that the pastor and the board chair recant and fix the heresy on this mural. But just as before, the pastor said, it's a non-issue, just don't look at it. But for this group of members, it was an issue. And they decided to go down the road a few miles and start their own Seventh-day Adventist church. Their church, they decided, would stick to the Bible. Their church would lead people down the straight and narrow path to heaven, not the <coughs> wide path to destruction that the pastor and the church board chair were going down. So the church split in two. And by now you're probably wondering, what was this heresy? What was so problematic about this painting that a church would split over it? Well, I'll tell you. In the first part of the mural, in the scene of the Garden of Eden, on the two main characters, Adam and Eve, were belly buttons. <laughs> That's right. Adam and Eve couldn't have belly buttons, right? A church split over belly buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Satan knows how to divide a church and sometimes we make it easy for him. We confuse our preferences with our purpose. The color we paint, the carpet we choose, the clothes we wear, and the music we listen to are all preferences that we choose in our walk with Jesus, but they are not our purpose. In fact, all these other issues mean nothing in comparison to the purpose of this church. 
Our purpose is to be the hands and feet of Jesus to others. Living as God's community requires us to be in fellowship with one another so that we can be better reflections of our Lord Jesus Christ. This community is about Jesus. My grandmother didn't call the, the church leadership because she didn't like wearing skirts. She didn't call because she wanted to fight for her right to wear pants. My grandmother called because she didn't want anyone to be turned away from Christ. She didn't want people to feel the embarrassment that she felt that day. And she wanted everyone to be able to walk in through those doors of the church and be welcomed and feel loved by a community. She wanted everyone to feel the embrace of Christ's people having fellowship together. This church is about Christ, and anything else isn't worth fighting about. And the best news about this is that we are all in the same boat, so to speak. We've all done wrong. We're all sinners. And still God takes us, puts us together, and makes us a community, a community that can reach out and help others. Chapter 1, starting with verse 26, says this. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Friends, we are blessed. Despite our flaws, God has blessed this church. We can see it from the new building that's going up next door. We can see it when we have our, um, our work be and see all the people that come out and help us. We can see it on those days on Sabbath morning when we come in and it's hard for us to find a seat. God is blessing this church, and I believe that he will continue to bless this church as long as we stay focused on what our purpose is. Our purpose is to be the hands and feet of Jesus here in this community. And I'll leave you with some final words from Paul that he says about the issue. Chapter 1, starting with verse 30. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to us here at Springtown. Lord, I ask that you continue to bless this church and you help us to stay focused on you, Lord. Lord, I ask that as we go about our, our way, different ways today, that you will continue to be with us and bless us and keep us safe, Lord. We, we love seeing the growth in this church. We love seeing our new building going up, Lord, and we are so excited to see what you're going to do in this community. Lord, we ask that you continue to use us and help us to be the kind of people that are your hands and feet to this community. In your name we pray all of these things. Amen.